Sam, tomorrow might be the most exciting day of the year. I thought Christmas already happened. No, I'm kidding. I know. I'm super excited. <laughs> yeah, what's the biggest thing you're hoping to see in the premiere of the book of Boba Fett? Ooh, uh, just Boba Fett just kicks some butt. All um, right. He's just so cool, Mando. I think um, that's probably going to happen. What about you, BB Nate? I don't know. Just just a really good show. I'm excited to see what they what they do. See if we can actually make the uh, the the hype live up to, exactly. you know, to mm-hmm. the 42 years of this character. <laughs> right? We've got, we've got a lot of crazy speculation coming out this this week on the uh, show so let's just get right to it this is tatooine sons it's true, it's true. All of it. All of it. what is the name of the porg on the millennium falcon force is strong in my family what do you think his name is <laughs> it's a big moment i am a jedi like my father before me Maybe Turbis? Do or do not. There is no try. Turbis? <laughs> Pablo, if you're listening to this live stream, that porg's name is now Turbis. It's a good Star Wars name. We're not done yet. These guys record an awesome podcast called Tatooine Sons. Everybody was lit. Well, it was mom's birthday. Mom's birthday. Mom's birthday. Yeah, happy, uh, happy birthday, mom and Jesus. All right. Um, uh, favorite Christmas gift you got this year, Samuel the Hutt. Oh, you're putting me on the spot. And you have a girlfriend, so you. I know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there was just, there was. I appreciated them all, and they all were, were special. I mean, I've gotten a lot of use of my new headphones okay. already. Those are nice. That's cool. Yeah, I've gotten you? a lot of use out of those too. I'm not sure. All of them were great, and I don't like really choosing stuff. So. Oh. You got a cool Batman spotlight. Yes, I did. That like, oh, yeah, like shines it a on search the light. I did, wall. and I decided to make an and 89 I got, reference, so now it shines from the mirror onto uh-huh. the ceiling. And you got, I got a, a R2D2 Sensi warmer. I don't know if it's like a people know wax it yeah. melter, but we didn't know this when we got it. But when you turn it on, it has like a blue holographic projection of Leia inserting the Death Star it's fans in so R2. It's so cool. Anyway, it's so cool. welcome to Tatooine Sons of Pop Culture <laughs> Podcast, the only fan podcast to name a can of Star Wars creature and be endorsed by Ryan Johnson. We believe that pop culture is the mythology of our generation, that there is a story written on our souls and that these myths speak to that story. And that is why we were talking about Matrix, Resurrections, and the Hawkeye finale and giving a preview mm-hmm. of the book of Boba Fett. I'm okay. David. I'm the dad. Hi, dad. Hi, guys. I'm honored to be joined every week by my two amazing sons, you Sam. Flatter I flatter you. <laughs> That's good. Sam, I have a feeling we know what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, we've barely even gotten a taste of what the Book of Boba Fett has to offer. And I'll talk about how and why that's the case. Very nice. Very nice. BB Nate, what about you? Well, I think the MCU just had its best finale for TV, in my opinion. Well, you might be a little biased. I am O. (laughs) <laughs> I am oh, you, What about you dad uh, Matrix Resurrections uh, Matrix Resurrections Matrix Resurrections, <laughs> Matrix Resurrections uh, Might have the most trippy opening act in movie history Honestly for sure um, But before we get to all that This episode is sponsored by Cufflinks.com They have over 3,000 items on their website From Star Wars, Marvel, DC, Lord of the Rings NFL, NCAA, Major League Baseball NBA and everything else That you can think of Even stuff that we don't watch Like Star Trek uh, We're very honored <laughs> Uh, to be sponsored by this amazing company. Thank you guys so much for being our sponsors. Check them out. We'll talk a little bit more about them later in the show. Uh, if you're the, the, the first time listening to the show, welcome. Uh, we're super excited you're here. Please follow the show on whatever app you're listening to it on. If you're a regular listener, thanks for coming back. If you're not following the show, go ahead and do that. Press that button down. Uh, Friday's episode is different. We've got Gregory, or Gregory, where'd that come from? I don't, I don't know. know. I'm even looking at it. And it <laughs> says Jeffrey. Uh, and you somehow said great. My mind had lost me for left me for a second. Jeffrey Calhoun, uh, he's a screenwriter. He teaches screenwriting. Oh, and he's wow. going to talk about what makes a good story. That's very cool. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, but let's stop talking about stuff we're going to talk about. Let's talk about what we're actually talking about. It's not confusing at all. Yeah, it's Almost kind of like the Matrix. The Matrix yeah. yeah. Um, well, the book of Boba Fett is set to premiere tomorrow. So we're going to go over everything we know, as well as give some not so responsible speculations. That's all next. Be on your guard. There are older and fouler things than orcs in the deep places of the world. All right. 
it then. Keep your secrets. trailers and TV spots for this show. Awesome. And I'm a lot more excited about it after watching them all through, because I kind of had been sporadic as to if I'd seen them or not, so it was, it was a lot That's of fun to go back I'm through. I'm very excited about this. Yeah. yeah, anyway, let's let's just get into the segment. So, for those of you who may not be familiar with the story of Boba Fett, we're going to do a very quick recap in um, my style. Do you really is, think there's people listening to a, a pop no. culture podcast that was started off as a Star Wars podcast that don't have any idea who Boba Fett is? No, but I'm just covering all the bases. Okay. <laughs> so this is basically if Grammy's listening. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So Boba Fett, he was the clone son of Jango Fett, but he doesn't get old super fast like regular clones. All right. Uh, his dad Makes eventually sense. loses his head. So Boba oh, goes geez. off and becomes a bounty hunter and eventually starts wearing his dad's armor. He's eventually hired by Darth Vader. Wait, do you think, just can we stop and say how creepy that is? You take your dad's head out of a helmet and then start putting that helmet on mm-hmm. all the time? Uh, yeah. Do you yeah. think he even washed it? I hope so. <laughs> I really hope. All right. Um, oh, that story. <laughs> he, <that's, laughs> him repurposing the armor. Yeah. Uh, but eventually he was hired by Vader to locate and entrap Luke Skywalker. And Boba gets um, Han in the process. And. Han. Um, later on, when Luke and the gang break Han out of Jabba's palace, Boba Han. gets knocked into the Sarlacc pit and dies. Just kidding. He shows up later and helps Mando <laughs> out and gets his armor back. After a nice glow up on his armor, Boba joins Mando and helps him retrieve Baby Yoda. Then Boba decides to go back to Tatooine to take over Jabba's business because why not? All right, stop. This is probably the first time that the word ever, the, the phrase glow up was ever associated with Boba Fett. <laughs> yes, you're welcome for that. Right, that, that this is a historic moment. This is a historic moment. All right, <laughs> All right now that we're done with that, um, let's talk about what we know about the story and this uh, series. And honestly, we don't know very much. They have been keeping plot details really close to the chest. But only like... Um, yeah. Yeah. The director, Robert Rodriguez, says that everything we've seen so far in the trailers has just been from the first half of the first episode. Usually it's from the first half of the series. Right. We're getting nothing but the first half of the first episode. It's going to have to be a long episode. That's what I'm a lot of. The yeah. Time. I mean, the reason why this is the case is he says that everything is too spoilery to show after mm-hmm. that point. Is he overestimating how little we've seen, Nate? Because you're saying, like, as you know, that seems like a lot for the first half mm-hmm. of an episode. Do you think maybe he's just exaggerating, or do you really think that this is all from that first half, and that there are some serious twists coming? I think that there, we can expect some serious twists coming. Judging by, they have to recreate the hype around Mandalorian season one again mm. because this show has to be big. It's the second live action show for Star Wars. That's a good point. So if it if it falls flat in people's eyes, then it's not going to be as big and they have a big problem on their hands. So I think that they're going to have to throw a lot in, just judging by how Boba Fett... They're going to, of course, see Boba Fett getting out of the Sarlacc pit. We've already seen some shots of that. So that happens in the first episode. We're going to definitely get more plot points in the second half of that first episode. We might get some, you know, like Dad's wanting some Crimson Dawn stuff or just some bigger crime syndicate stuff. Who knows? Maybe we'll see Luke again. But... I don't know. I, I think that you're onto something there, BB Nate, that they have to have. I don't think you can ever capture the same uh, type of moment as the Baby Yoda it's, moment. Then, yeah, the yeah. never. But they have but to capture that height. They have to find some way to grab the, the viewers again. And they have a big task on their hands. And that is we've got to remember that the, the 99% of the people watching the Book of Boba Fett this week OK, mm-hmm. and I'm not even just saying Wednesday because there's going to be all the crazies that are up at, you know, 3 a.m. Eastern um, watching I mean, the, the I, it's not going to happen. Uh, the Book of Boba Fett <laughs> on, on Wednesday morning. And then there's going to be all of the rest of us that are still crazy enough to watch it. You know, we're going to wa- find time to watch it that day. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Then there's going to be all of the casual Star Wars fans, which this show is built for. Yeah. 
that are going to watch it the rest of this week. They've got to find a way to differentiate this from The Mandalorian mm-hmm. because there are still people out there that get confused um, about that. Is that Boba? I, I'm honestly, there are people in the mm-hmm. in the general casual Star Wars world that are trying to figure out the Boba Fett stuff and yeah, everything else. It. And so, and then, well, what who, what time frame is this? There are people that don't understand the time frame of The Mandalorian. They're going to have to differentiate this story from The Mandalorian story, and I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. So I do think that there's going to be some big twists. Coming. Okay, that's a good point. Um, so here's what we are given for the story. Uh, this is the synopsis. It says, The Book of Boba Fett, a thrilling Star Wars adventure teased in a surprised end credit sequence following the season two finale of The Mandalorian. It finds legendary bounty hunter Boba Fett and mercenary Fennec Shand navigating the galaxy's underworld when they return to the sands of Tatooine to stake their claim on the territory once ruled by Jabba the Hutt and his crime syndicate. And that's about that's it. That's about all we have story wise. They have been intentionally three keeping... things in that 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 make this worth watching from our from my perspective. Boba Fett, Boba Fett, <laughs> Fennec Shand, and Tatooine. Yeah, all right. Yep. <laughs> um, but that's it. So, do you guys think that they have been heavily relying or relying too much on the name Boba Fett? To draw audiences in, do you think that that's a mistake? I do. I do think that they have been using Boba Fett as a crutch because he is a big deal, a very big deal. Um, he spawned the Mandalorian craze for just the costumes, yeah. and it's a humongous deal. A lot of people know about Boba Fett, but there is a problem with using his name as a crutch and him as a crutch it's worrying about how good the show is going to be. Mm-hmm. I'm worried that the show is going to be a lower tier than what we've expected just because they have a big character in the title role, which is the great thing about the Mandalorian was that it did not deal with any of the big characters in star Wars. And so it, it dealt with these side characters. Then it works really well. It built the universe. But now that we're having, go, we're going back to Tatooine. We're having job of the hut back. We're having Boba Fett back. It we're having, like, we're having old Ben Kenobi in a flashback. Scene. Totally. Um, oh yeah, yeah. 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 We're having all these, these characters Han back. Solo. It feels like they might be Harrison Ford's coming back as Han Solo. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, wait, really? wait, I'm sorry. I'm skipping ahead to bad news. Okay. Anyway, it feels like we might be going back and we, I don't know if they'll be able to capture what made the Mandalorian good. And they, they, they do run a risk in this yeah. series. And then the big risk is that all of the, uh, 40 plus years of Boba Fett, hate because you know boba fett's a, a paralyzing character right? mm-hmm. or, or polarizing, polarizing paralyzing paralyzing he's, i mean he, he did, could be he paralyzing did. depends on how he's fighting you and where he <laughs> hits but um a polarizing character right there are people like you sam who absolutely think he's the coolest thing in the world but you know is. it's because he it, looks cool he looks cool <laughs> and you're in you and you think that's awesome and then there's that group of uh, super boba fett fans that love him because of the legend stuff but yeah. when you come to canon he's got four minutes of screen time before the mandalorian <laughs> season two Right. And so um, the hype around Boba Fett was always bigger than the character yeah. of mm-hmm. Boba Fett. And so the challenge there is that they don't deliver. If they don't deliver, if Dave Filoni, John Favreau as executive producers, and then Robert Reg- Rodriguez as the director don't pull off lightning in a bottle a second time, mm-hmm. Mandalorian, uh, you know, the second coming of the Mandalorian uh, in, in <laughs> yeah. this, they run the risk of damaging the character, um, which is mm-hmm. going to hurt them. And and at this point, the way that Star Wars has gone and been so crazy in the Disney era, it's been awesome. I mean, we're not haters of the Disney era of Star Wars by any means. Everybody knows that. But it has been controversial and it hasn't always been well received. And if they mess with the Boba Fett character and fail with it, the danger to the franchise is big Mm -hmm. with this. And so they I really do hope that they deliver with it. It's a very bold move that they're going Mm -hmm. with this so soon and getting into Disney Plus. The second live action series is going to be the Boba Fett series. That's a very risky. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I I get where y'all are coming from. I've from the beginning I've gotten a very different feel from this series. Um this might be a little bit too harsh and this pro- I'll probably be disproven of this when the show comes out, but it almost feels cheaper 
in a way, I don't know, maybe that that's just me, but the effects look great, but there's just something a little bit off about it. Well, th- then again, you can't judge that on the first half of the first episode. Right. It's a lot of setup at that point. Mm-hmm. You've got a lot to explain for the backstory. And there's, of course, that, that first half is obviously what happened. And then the second half is going to be what's going to happen mm-hmm. in the series. So I don't think you can judge that that's off fair. of that. Yeah, I, but I am nervous, you know, putting my mm-hmm. love of Boba Fett aside. There is a lot riding on on this show. I mean, it'd be different if it's Ahsoka. That's still a huge deal. But it's not this character that's had this 40-plus year legacy like mm-hmm. Boba Fett has. So yeah. No, in, in fact, it's the exact opposite. It's Ahsoka is a character that's, you know, what, 12, 13 years old? Yeah. Um, and has had seven seasons of The Clone Wars. Mm-hmm. Four se- or th- not four seasons. She was involved in two Three-ish. in two seasons mm-hmm. really of of Rebels, and she had her live action transition in in the Mandalorian. There's a lot more stuff about Ahsoka right. uh, to build off of. Um, this one is 40 years of Boba Fett without a lot to build off of. Yeah, and I read in an article, um, Robert Rodriguez said in, a, in a, an interview that he generally doesn't like to work on big names or big projects like Star Wars or Marvel and stuff. He likes to work with smaller things because people can't get upset at, with him if he's creating all of the stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, you he's like, you know, you work on something with Star Wars and everybody's going to yell at you about you know what you're doing because it, they may not like, like you it. can make a brilliant movie like Ryan Johnson did with the last Jedi and everybody hates right. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people hate you. Because um, <laughs> but he was actually interested in taking the character of Boba Fett because there's so little exactly. about him. He mm-hmm. says it kind of feels like a blank slate. He can create. He what said he wants. as fans are going to be okay with it as long as they don't make him act like a buffoon and he's awesome the whole time, which it, is true and not true at the same time. For someone like me, that sounds great. You make him not an idiot, you make him kick some butt, I'm happy with Boba Fett. But then there are people who are a little more refined in their taste and they may not be satiated with that. I think that it's it's a great point that it is it is a blank canvas, but it also plays heavily into what the danger of headcanon. And a lot of people have built up 40 years of headcanon for Boba Fett. You, fed by legends. Exactly. Fed by legends. Legends has become dangerous for headcanon. Um, so it's very risky. And a lot of people just can't can't have that headcanon go away. Mm. So. All right, so let's get into some predictions uh, for this show and what y'all think you want to see. I know, Dad, you've mentioned this like pretty much every time we've talked about this series, but who do you want to see show up eventually? I want the villain to be Kira. Okay. I want the character that we saw in Solo, A Star Wars Story to be 15, 20 years down the road and um, not the confident but subservient character that she is in solo mm-hmm. she, you know she mm-hmm. is definitely um lower on the pecking order than dryden voss and obviously maul um with that and that's the way that that story ends and she's also sweet she's got her love and her affection mm-hmm. for, for for han she wants she's willing to sacrifice for han and that type of thing i want to see that jaded cynical um more mm-hmm. villainous version of Kira that they're developing in the uh, comic books right now translate into live action. Um, if that twist comes in the end of the first episode, you're going to find me a very happy person okay. going into this. Nate, I, I do want to see Kira a lot just because of my love for solo, but I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a lot that could, could happen in this series. And I think if they really wanted to get some more hype, they could put potentially put Luke into the series. Um, again, and now I'm not a huge fan of having everything ride on the Skywalkers, but I do think that after the end of more of Mandalorian season two, it is possible now, and that could be a way that it could tie into um, Mandalorian a little bit more um, with him having Grogu and everything. And now it could just be one episode again, but it could build the hype of yeah. everything around and connect it to the Mandalorian universe That's a little true. bit more. Yeah, and then. Um I know that uh, this kind of leads into what you've been saying, but as is customary with Tatooine Sons and all of our previews, give your craziest prediction, sure to go wrong, go dead. Me first? Yes, crazy. I know you want Kira to show up. and That's then not a that, crazy but... prediction. I think that that's legit. So go um, nuts. 
Um, I'm going to give two. One of them is probably crazy, but could could lit- legitimately happen. That's Prince Shizor um, and oh, yeah. Black Sun oh, yeah. uh, making an appearance in this. Um, my craziest prediction is that that really is Ben Kenobi uh, in a flashback <laughs> sequence. <laughs> I joke about that. I want it to be. I don't think it is, yeah. but I hope I, I would love for that to mm. happen. So that's my crazy prediction. I'm not sure. Um I don't know. It's it's like anything you predict could be crazy because we don't know enough about this show. That's a good point. Um, I don't know. There's a lot that it's just there's so much unknown with this series. You can't even figure out where to go with okay. the story. So, a mall, a mall flashback. A mall flashback. Yeah. 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 Well, while we may not know much about the story in this series, we do know that it promises to be packed to the gills with action and apparently twists. Um, While the hype around this show may not be on par with Mandalorian, I have a feeling that once fans get a taste for this show, they won't be able to get enough. So be sure to tune in tomorrow on Disney+. Plus. Yeah, definitely. Good job. Thank you. Samuel, like, you, you really, truly are excited about this yes, series. Yes, this is so. going to be fun. <laughs> That's yes. cool. Awesome. Well, our little, our, uh, little clickbait segment has seen its fair share of sites that are infamous for their click, clickbaitosity. That's a new word. Clickbaitosity. I like it. Uh, one site that we have trained ourselves, though, to completely ignore over the years is express.uk.co. Express.co. Co.uk is what I think. Is that what it is? Yeah, I think you have. See how, much I've, see how much I've trained You're myself. You're so good ignore at ignoring it, you forgot yeah. it. Uh, but for, for our last episode of 2021, we've got three articles from the site to help us ring in the new year. Oh, and that's up boy. next on Bad News. This is not going to go the way you think. All right, so I finally got to do it, guys. What? What's that? I got to wear my Millennium Falcon. Oh, yay. Yay. yay! Finally. I wore them to Christmas Eve, which was weird because I was wearing like black and blue instead of red and green. Red and green. I didn't care. If somebody came, I was fully prepared. It's like Hanukkah. It's like Hanukkah? Hanukkah. No, that's not it. That, I, was gonna, I was ready for somebody to say, why are you wearing blue? So you could show off your cufflinks. Well, that's true, because they're awesome. They are. Um, with it, but I was going to say it's a blue Christmas. Um, uh, nobody asked them. No, that's nobody cared. Did you want me to ask? I could have asked. You could have, but you didn't. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, you guys wore some cufflinks.com stuff to Christmas Eve. Yeah, I wore my... Um, my Spider-Man outfit again, although I didn't have the cufflinks because my my French cuff shirt. Yeah, we got to get those cleaned. Not dry I, clean. I uh, wore my Batman tie and tie bar and socks again. So we had to wear. We were both wearing red because you know we had to. Be you Christmas guys kind of followed the, followed the Christmas pr- yeah, protocols. Yeah. I didn't. <laughs> um, but that's cool. Um, yeah, I love everything they've got over there. Cufflinks.com has got amazing stuff. You guys are just awesome. I, I yes. know that we like go on about it in every episode, but the reality is they have everything that you're looking yeah, for. They have over 3000 items on the website covering not just cufflinks, but ties, tie bars, socks, money clips, and other great gifts. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Well, while Christmas may be over, maybe you got some Chris, some money for Christmas, some and you Christmas case. Yeah, so you want to get yourself some cool little nerdy dress stuff. Uh, they got go, a lot of really good Boba Fett they stuff. Do. Oh yeah, I've got I've got a few like ties. official new Boba Fett stuff. That's Wait, that's it. Yeah, I know. Oh man, <laughs> I need to go on their website now. But use the code Tatooine fifteen at checkout to receive fifteen percent off everything on the site with no minimum order. Yep. Head on over to cufflinks.com today. Remember to use that code he just talked about, Tatooine 15, to check out Get Your Boba Fett gear now. Well, you want the bad news or the really bad news? All right, bad news article one. Harrison Ford is returning to Star Wars as Han Solo once again, but big change this time. What? He's not going to have the jacket? Or the vest? No. Uh, our first uh, little article from express.co.uk claims that Harrison Ford is returning to Star Wars for a special appearance in the book of Boba Fett. Really? Of course, the infamous clickbait site follows a common clickbait practice um, of sourcing the rumor from another clickbait site that you're very familiar with, Giant Freaking Robot. Oh, yeah. Um, the article claims that Ford will be dramatically de-aged. And, oh. And it ties the rumor to photos of Ford wearing CGI dots on his face. Okay. But the photos are not from Star Wars. They're from the set of the fifth installment of Indiana Jones, which is currently <laughs> in production. And it's not the Book of Boba Fett. So for all of that... And the fact that I can't stand this website, I'm going to give it a clickbait <laughs> level nine. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, Wesley Snipes Blade return wanted by Marvel Multiverse of Madness with Mahershala Ali. Another really common, common clickbait tactic is to bury the story teased in a headline several paragraphs down into the article. 
This is what we find in the express.co.uk article about Wesley Snipes apparently returning as a variant version of Blade. In an attempt to tap into the excitement about the appearance of different versions of Spider-Man in No Way Home, the article once again cites giant freaking robot. We're, we're just getting both of them. Oh yeah, it's double duty. Um, as a source for a rumored possibility that Snipes could potentially appear alongside Mahershala Ali in Doctor Strange 2. After No Way Home, it seems like anything is possible, but this doesn't seem very likely. Clickbait level 7. Do we even know if Mahershala Ali's blade is showing up? No. I, I, he's only showed up once. But Well, he was just a voice at the end of Eternals mm-hmm. in, in a post-credit oh, yeah. scene. But that's that's, that's all we have so far. Mm-hmm. And the next one, Doctor Strange 2. Tobey Maguire set for Multiverse of Madness and his own Spider-Man 4. Good lord. <laughs> Once again, express.co.uk takes advantage of the hysteria over No Way Home by digging up an old rumor by a fandom wire, which is a fairly legitimate website. The rumor is over a year old and was tied to Tobey Maguire's appearance in No Way Home, also claiming he would appear in Doctor Strange 2, and then tacks on a trusted and proven sources rumor from the robot and whips up a new clickbait article. Multiple reports have surfaced from credible news sites that the cameos in Doctor Strange 2 are numerous, so we cannot rule it out. So I'll give this a six. This is probably probably one of the more reputable ones we've had on this i mean it, it's got there's no proof to it but it's got the most credence to and it. i think that's a lot about what giant freaking robot does they throw out about a thousand different rumors and then they get two right mm-hmm. and they're like see we our pr- trusted improvement <laughs> sources got it right exactly and they can put that up on that website and ha- and nobody's calling out the ones like, they should have a untrusted and unproven sources page too for all of them they've gotten wrong right mm-hmm. um with it but enough about the bad news let's talk about some good news Um, In December 2017, the three of us walked out of a movie theater with a feeling that was honestly very hard to describe. Uh, We knew we loved The Last Jedi, but it was nearly impossible to explain all the reasons why. Um, It seems like we're experiencing a bit of that deja vu all over Uh again after seeing Matrix Resurrections. We'll try to verbalize the feeling for you next. Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. Rebellions are built on hope. Force is with me, and I am with the Force. If you live long enough, you see the same eyes in different people. Arguably so. <laughs> yeah. There was moments where I was like, am I stuck in the Matrix somewhere? What <laughs> right. in the world is going right. on? Uh, we were all so confused. Did, did they like put a gag reel at the front of the movie? <laughs> I watched. I was watching Dad more than the movie at that point, and he just kept shaking his head. He was just so confused as to what. I know. I, can't, I absolutely cannot wait to watch it again tonight, just you and me, Nate, since Sam's got a launch society meeting. Is that what's going on tonight? Yup. All right. Well. Good for us. All right. Um, before we get into it too deep, uh, rating and reasons, scale of one to 10 time loops, BB Nate. Time loops. Ooh. Um, an eight or eight and a half. I'm going to go 8.5. I'm not going to give it quite a nine, but I'm going to give it an 8.5. I just really think that it went back to what the Matrix was with originality, which is something I was worried about. I really was worried that they were going to just be. Li- relying on the nostalgia of the original movies to to make a good one but they didn't they did something original they did something new and it felt good and it felt like the matrix it was definitely original um and new sam what about your rating and reason one to ten time loops i'm gonna give it an eight um because well first off i want to see it again sometime and i'm sure i will but Yes, it was original. It did something fresh with the story. It was mind boggling, which I always like that in a movie, a movie that gets you to think and subverts your expectations. I know they make fun of this in the movie, so I'm kind of feeding into it, but a few more action sequences wouldn't have hurt. Um, but you know, that's such a small gripe. The story itself was really good. Um, so that's why I'm giving it an eight for now. That'll probably change later on though. I'm going to give it a nine. (gasps) Wow. Um, Wow. because I, it, it, 
messed with me so much all the way from the beginning mm-hmm. to the end. Yeah. And then, you know, I've had the opportunity because I'm preparing for this segment. You guys aren't to research it more, to research it more, to watch a bunch of stuff about it. And the more I watch about it, the more brilliant this movie seems to become. Um, we'll which, see how all this holds up after second. Viewing. Seeing it again tonight is going to yeah. make a big difference for me um, with that. All right. So it worked last week on our no way home uh, reaction where we had three big questions. Mm-hmm. Um, I figured, why don't we go with it again? Big question. Uh, number one, what in the world was <laughs> happening in the first act of this, uh, BB Nate, one foundational concept in Matrix Resurrections is this idea of the modal um, with it. What is it and why is that so important to understand? It is a program that was built for the original Matrix games and it is a certain kind of like, I guess, a level in, in a certain way of the original Matrix titles. And uh, n- at the beginning, Neo left one open, programmed a new one using original Matrix code. And we find out that it was basically himself and others trying to get him out of there. It was fail safe practically. And so this modal was created in a, uh, just slightly different ways with bugs and Morpheus as an agent Smith Morpheus combo in that modal. And so bugs got him out of that modal and was able to finally let Neo free. So why is that important though? Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out the modals thing myself. Um, <laughs> I, <sighs> I really don't know. That whole modal thing still confuses me even I'm now. I'm sure it'll make more sense after. Yeah, if y'all figure view. it out after this next viewing, please let me know because I'm still pretty confused about what it is. I know it helped them get to to Neo, um, and I know I guess it was kind of built to like for programs to be able to improve themselves like over more and more. So what I understand the modals are, it's the way that um, the analysts, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later, the modals, the entire idea of the modals is a way to kind of keep a time loop going to keep Neo or Thomas Anderson Mm -hmm. in under his control Okay. um, with it. So these modals are these constant time loops that are happening in the game that basically every time Neo becomes close, Thomas Anderson becomes close to understanding what's going on. Something happens and it resets it puts Mm -hmm. it back into this uh, this thing again and so what thomas did neo did is he programs in this ai that's going to be a learning a learning ai that's going to every time it resets a modal it's going to help him this ai understand a little bit more self-learning okay uh you machine to the point where it starts to break free of that and that's what turns into morpheus um okay with it. so it's really important with that uh, you talked about this bb nate uh, a minute ago but um we need to come back to it because you said that you know in the original matrix games, which doesn't make any sense, right? Because this Matrix is a movie. Mm -hmm. That's part of the weirdness of this. Anyway, uh, we quickly discover very early on in our uh, story that Thomas Anderson is back and he's back as a game designer like he was in the original movie. But this time he's this world famous creator of a trilogy of games actually called The Matrix. And these games are the story that we originally saw in the trilogy beginning 20 years ago. But now Thomas is being asked by Warner Brothers... To make a fourth installment of this game, Sam, help me understand. What is this entire storyline supposed to be about? Uh, This was part of what made this story so brilliant, is it was not only showing how the Matrix is gaslighting Anderson or Neo, but it's gaslighting the viewers at the same time. Because there were points where I'm watching this and I'm like, wait, are they just throwing out like are they, were they done with the original stuff like are those are they really just saying that those were games like you, it not only it, it causes the viewers to feel just as confused as neo is in this moment we're just as mind-boggled as he is um and with them mentioning things like warner bros and stuff like that it it brings the story into the real world with us because Warner Bros. is a real world entity that made the movie. Right. That made this movie that we're watching and the old movies. So it's just referencing things that are outside of the movies and it's just completely Mm -hmm. trippy. And the point of it is to have us as confused as Neo is. Exactly. It was it was genius on how they did it. It was it. It was a way that we've we've had the Matrix for what, 20 years now. And we all know that they're movies. But it still made us question if they actually were in that first 45 minutes. It did it so well that you were wondering, okay, well, 
maybe they were just games and we just watched the cutscenes, I guess, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and you know and that that's not reality. Exactly. But it makes you question your own reality. Exactly. It makes you question your own sanity, which is exactly what's going on with Thomas Anderson right. in this. Mm-hmm. He's questioning his reality. He's questioning his sanity. He is the point of view character in this movie, and you are literally feeling the same feelings and the emotions and the confusion mm-hmm. that he's feeling, which goes all the way back to the first few minutes of the original Matrix movie when you think you're watching one style of movie and then you get to that moment when Smith is interrogating Nia, or mm-hmm. Thomas Anderson in the police station and you think you know what this movie is about and then all of a sudden Nia, Thomas Anderson's mouth <laughs> disappears and this crazy thing bug turns in machine turns into a bug thing that crawls into him and it's you're like what in the and world then he wakes up and everything's normal what is going on mm-hmm. and that's what they wanted to do with this and it was absolutely brilliant and we all know uh we uh, coming into this movie we all knew that morpheus would be yes. back uh in the matrix resurrections um what we didn't see company coming was what you guys also talked about i think bb nate earlier was that morpheus would be an ai program mm-hmm. developed by thomas anderson to test if he was insane or not did you like the twist that they did with morpheus i here? did i thought it was very interesting and even though it was a different type of Morpheus and everything, it still did the same thing the original Morpheus did. It Didn't was the they same. say that he was merged he with was, Smith Yes, as he well? was mixed with an Agent Smith. It was half, half Smith, half Morpheus, mm. which works really well, too, because him being an agent in that modal helped him set himself apart from the original Morpheus. And it didn't feel like some people might have felt like it was a disservice to Lawrence Fishburne and his Morpheus, but it wasn't. It was a different character, just with the same name. I mean, yeah, there were points where he was kind of like quoting things that mm-hmm. lo- that the original Morpheus said, but in a, like a irreverent way, you know, like blah, 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 which would feel weird without knowing that this is a Smith Morpheus exactly. as well. Mm-hmm. He's not going to take things as seriously yeah. as the original Morpheus. It's would. a different character just with the same name. And so I really enjoyed the twist. And what you under- need to understand is that I, I, I think if we go back and we see this in the movie, what we're going to find tonight, BB Nate is that Thomas didn't actually program him to be Morpheus or to be Smith. He programmed elements of that type exactly. of, of character into this AI, and the AI adopted those okay. characteristics of Morpheus because in the construct, he watches he watch all everything. of mm-hmm. what's going on with Morpheus and Neo, and he's trying to get through to Neo to help Neo. So he adopts the character of mm-hmm. Morpheus as part of this in his realization. There are scenes in this movie. You watch it tonight, BB Nate Sam. When you get a chance to watch it again, go back where you see Morpheus, or excuse me, where you see Neo and, and doing certain tasks, meaningful ta- or meaningless tasks in the in his own little time loop. Mm-hmm. And you also see the Morpheus character doing the exact same things um, going through. You see Neo running on a treadmill. And then a little bit yeah. later, mm-hmm. you see this Morpheus being running on a treadmill. Oh. You see Neo sitting in a coffee shop with it raining on the window. And then you see a few minutes later, this Morpheus character mm-hmm. doing it. You see Neo reaching out to touch the glass oh, uh, in yeah, his mirror yeah. and nothing's happening. And, and you then see you Morpheus see Morpheus touch it. through and he actually goes, it pokes through right. with it. And that's the moment of Morpheus's revelation of, of the, there's more going on here mm. with it so it's really interesting so that's all the way out of all the way through the big question number two i mean number one kind wow. of like five minutes to do the rest of the entire episode but anyway <laughs> uh, big question number two who is the analyst the trailers of this film all suggested that this analyst played by neil patrick harris would be a critical character uh in the story i'm just not sure any of us saw him as being the ultimate villain um he is the architect of this version of the matrix. But instead of building a system on logic and reason, he builds one built on passion and emotion. Sam, what is Lana Wachowski trying to say with this new version of the story? Ooh, um, that motion, I guess that emotions and passion are, is more powerful than logic and reason. And you can, part of why, debates happen on things why you know part the reason why everybody argues about one position or another on whether this literally movie's anything good or not yeah whether this movie is good or not whether you know you're a left wing or right wing whatever it is 
everybody gets so heated about it because not because of logic and emotion. You can provide a perfectly logical argument about something and not change someone's mind like Nathan did with um, No Time to Die. It was a completely logical um, explanation, completely made sense to me. But my feelings toward the movie was I didn't like it based, you know, logic or not. I just didn't like it. Emotions and passion are more powerful in some ways than logic and emotion or than logic and reason. Definitely. And I think that was he, it was the AI and the matrix learning from what happened originally. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a emotion and passion that destroyed the matrix in the first place. It was Neo being the first one to make the decision to save Trinity. Yep. Um, instead of doing the logical thing, which is save all of humanity. Exactly. And that is what saved Zion. And that is what saved the matrix. One thing that none of the other ones ever did. And so it is also more powerful to keep the matrix going. They can run this insane new version that is so convincing that even the fans watching it are wondering if it's real or not. It is, it is, they obviously had the old version is what we see in the nineties, but this new version is upgraded and updated because of the power of the bond of the passion between Neo and Trinity. So it is, uh, it's really interesting that they decided to go with that. I've been, uh, you know, in, in, I, I've spent most of my adult life career path with one foot in the sales, sales management, sales training side of things. Mm-hmm. And the other side in nonprofit work or church work or ministry related work. Okay. And both in both spaces, this phrase has become something that I am absolutely convinced of. People make up their minds emotionally and justify those decisions rationally. Mm -hmm. People do not make up their minds rationally and then justify them based on their emotions. So the, what this, what the, the analyst seems to have discovered because of exactly what you're mm-hmm. saying, BB Nate, with what the sixth Neo did mm-hmm. in the original trilogy was he realized that logic wasn't going to win the day. So he figured out a way, and this is what makes the analyst so brilliant. He figures out a way to use emotion and primarily negative emotions, mm-hmm. fear, doubt, anxiety. There's so much going on in this that that, that um, the, the writers and, and everybody involved in this are trying to communicate. They're using things like mental illness and talking about how people are, st- are, are being controlled by this doubt instead of faith, which is a big, mm-hmm. a big issue with Neo. They're using th- the idea of prescriptions, mm-hmm. right? Just keep giving them yeah. the pills. Just keep giving them the pills so that they don't have to think for themselves and free their minds on all of this. All of this is tied into the emotion motion mm-hmm. of this versus the logic which then yeah it continues on it's it's what's really cool is the is the what happens in in the ending of the movie in the whole third act because emotion is what um uh wins the day right feeling and love mm-hmm. is still what wins the day um even though it's being used negatively by the analyst when it's used positively it moves forward big question number 3 um why did trinity advance faster than Neo. One of the big criticisms of Matrix Resurrections is based on the fact that Trinity did advance to this almost the one levels of power very quickly while Neo struggled throughout the entire film. B Nate, is this another Mary Sue type moment? Why or why not? It is not. I really don't think it is. Um, every The analyst, everybody in the Matrix, under first of all, underestimated Trinity's power. They always thought that the one is the only one capable of destroying the Matrix, because technically that is what happened at the end of uh, the, the trilogy. So they worked their best to keep Neo away from knowing that it ever existed. They put him on pills. They gave him an analyst or a therapist in this kind of a case. And just were trying their best to keep him down. But with Trinity, she had none of that. She didn't have any pills. She didn't have a therapist. They, they, she just had a family. And that was it. And so they, she was able to tap into her power she, easier because she wasn't as suppressed. She, wasn't as suppressed. Um, she also was unplugged with the power of Neo at that point. And so she was already in the case in the waking up process without having to go through everything and getting back into the real world. She was already infused with the bond of Neo again. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense. We discussed that 
you can't have the one without Trinity in this case. So the one is almost like this, it's like a dyad, if you think about it. Um, so they both have probably, from the beginning, had access to this power. It's just in the original trilogy. The anomaly is built into the, the code exactly. of the anomaly, mm-hmm. yeah. It's just in the original trilogy, Neo was the one who was fostered into that role and trained for it. While, like Nathan said, in this new movie, they had worked so hard to beat him down, he had the hardest time even doing the simplest things that he learned in the first movies. While, like you said, Trinity wasn't that case, so she just advanced faster. I mean, it is a little off-putting at first, just because you're not used Mm -hmm. to seeing her do that. You're expecting Neo to be the one to fly. Um, But it makes sense when when you think about it. It's interesting when you think about the original Matrix movie, um, it's it's uh, it's Trinity's belief in Neo being the one leading all the way up to when Neo dies in that Mm. in that train Mm -hmm. station or that building or whatever it is with with uh, Agent Smith. Mm -hmm. And he dies in the real world. right? Right. And and Trinity is like, I, you know. I know you have to be the one because the Oracle told me I would fall in love with the one and Mm. I'm in love with you. And then she kisses him and he arises Mm -hmm. and is awakened with the powers of the, of the one that bond again. Right. Okay. In this movie, it's Neo's belief Mm -hmm. in Trinity that rescues her Mm -hmm. from all of this. He's he's putting all his faith in her being able to come out of this. Right. And it's interesting at the top of that building, that kiss they kiss and then she's awake awakened in the same way mm-hmm. uh, um, with it. It's like they're paralleling it um, with it. It was, uh, I, I can't wait to see it again. I'm super excited about this. Let's finish recording. Um, anyway, um, let's talk a little bit before we do that about a dad moment. I am your father. So in the closing moments of the film, this analyst is chiding Neo and Trinity. He is arrogant And he is cocky because he's convinced of one very important thing. The Matrix will continue to live on because, and I quote, the sheeple aren't going anywhere. Um, They like living in deception. They'd rather have the comfort of certainty rather than the freedom to think for themselves. And this feels very real to me. Let someone else tell you what's acceptable to think and to do and to believe. As long as you don't question the narrative, you're fine. Just be very careful not to go to go against what the media and society society are telling you, um, because that makes you dangerous. But here's what history is has also told us: um, the crowd hasn't ever gotten it right. Uh, Jesus said it this way: there are two paths. One is wide and the crowd follows it. The other is narrow and few even find it. But the choice really is yours um, with that. So that's my dad moment. Anyway, um, if you're looking for a movie that's only about bullet time and wild action sequences and kung fu fights, uh, you'd be better served to go back and watch the original version of The Matrix. But if you do want a complex, multi-layered movie that will make you think deeply, question the world you're living in, uh, then we highly recommend that you see The Matrix Resurrections multiple times. Because you won't understand it the first one. It's going to take a few times to do that. So it's going to be, it's a weird movie week. BB Nate, uh, no new releases, but we did get a ton of trailers. We did. um, With it, we even new ones that we didn't even expect. Exactly. Yeah. And it's pretty obvious to see who's winning at the box office uh, still. uh, We'll talk a little bit more about that next. At last, we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. At last, we will have revenge. So we have no new nationwide releases this week. That's. Okay, sing it over. Bye. We're going to go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, we have a lot of trailers, though. We got the Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness teaser. Now, that was at the end. No way. At the end of No Way Home, but it was released publicly this time. And of course, I think we talked about it before, but it looks very good. And everybody's freaking out. Very, very excited. Now, this one. Doctor Strange. Oh, yes. Strange Supreme. I'm very excited about that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, now, this next one just dropped the day of we're recording, and I honestly didn't expect it to have Nobody a new one. expected um, it. They just dropped it. The Batman trailer three out of... They have a few TV spots, but I never expected to get a new trailer before yeah. March. But... This trailer looked really... All right, explain a little bit. It'll take a second. You're the Batman guy. Mm -hmm. Go. Uh, well, first of all, this was this this trailer had the most dialogue, so I'm gonna have to comb through it and you know get everything from that. But they have the character of Selena down the whole you know don't throw your life away. It's okay. I have nine. That was a 
perfect. It's Selena cheesy, line. but it worked. It was so, so well. well. And they have the character of Riddler down with um, Bat- with him insulting Batman's intelligence, maybe right. not as smart as I thought you were, um, which is again perfect for the Riddler. They have they have Bruce down with him, kind of just like you know, you're not doing enough for this city. You you your family has always been wealthy, but you're not doing anything with it. And I haven't seen you do anything. And he he's just kind of laughing. He's like, you you really have no clue what I'm doing. Um, it seems like they're just th- this feels like a comic book. We're finally getting a comic book. It feels book like movie. we're going court of owls. It does also more than oh, ever, yeah. doesn't it? It, it? Yeah, a lot. And there was one scene where they're walking down this hallway in this really old abandoned building, I think. And there's this this door with the graffiti, green graffiti, where it all started. And that could be a lot leading to Court of Owls. But also just touching by the feel of that scene feels very seven esque, mm-hmm. um, which is, of course, one of the influences for this movie. And I just have to watch this trailer. Again. again and again and again yes and, again. and, and then the figure, breakdowns of the trailer and figure out how to decode that message at the end that riddler left because yeah. I, I don't know how to do that it's already yet. been decoded probably right. um, the next one which was another surprise one we got the second trailer for uncharted which this one looks really good too it looks um, whack man. it does the, the the did you watch it dad i haven't seen this one um maybe you'll see it today but we it was great because they're having they, it feels like video game sequences yeah with the two helicopters and the boats and they're fighting between oh, yeah, yeah. And now that's there that. were two helicopters carrying, like, carrying two boats. old giant like pirate ships through a valley and like the people are like jumping from one boat to another fighting like mm-hmm. video game as 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 video game as you can get wow it was, it was great, great. Okay. yes and we got we got Soli's classic look at the end of the, the trailer, mustache, the, mustache, oh, dude, really? the Hawaiian shirt, shirt everything oh, okay. it was great it was really cool to see and now this next one was uh, a surprise for me for how actually interested it made me for the movie Death on the Nile, which is a sequel to the Murder, Murder on the Orient Express. Agatha Christie, uh, Agatha Christie, Hercule Poirot, that we got a few years ago in 2017, and that was a good one. I enjoyed that one, and I'm excited to see what they do with this one. I just hope it isn't a rehash of you know all of them did it. <laughs> so, I don't think it will be, um, but it looks but very good. A different it's got Gal Gadot in mm-hmm. it. It has a uh, Shuri. Yeah, Shuri. It has a uh, the. I forget her name, but she's from Down Abbey. She was one of the. Uh, oh yeah, one of the maids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah. It looks that. it looks really good and very very interesting. Plus, must- we get to see more of that, that amazing mustache. mustache. Oh. Nathan said I can grow hey, my mustache mm-hmm. like that he, if I he want. Could, if, you if you wanted. Now let's go for the box office numbers. Spider Man No Way Home took away the cake this week with eighty one million dollars domestically. I'd assume. Yes, not, not. that's domestic. And one it crossed the one billion mark globally. That is which insane. Is, uh, <laughs> impressive. In two, weeks. in two weeks, Sing Two actually did pretty good with twenty seven million sixty five million total domestic. And Matrix Resurrections came in third place, which is a little disappointing, but it is R. It, it, it is R, and it is a 22 million with 70 million total domestic. Looking at these numbers right now, it kind of makes me think okay, everybody that hadn't seen Spider Man No Way Home or that had to see it a second time went and saw that. <laughs> and then all the families that wanted to go to a movie on Christmas, Christmas weekend Day. that didn't it, go to Spider Man went, went to, to Sing, Sing two, 2, and all the people that don't have families that wanted to go to a movie on Spider Man uh, on this weekend that didn't see Spider Man wanted to go see Matrix. Yep, pretty much and that's pretty much what happened with that mm-hmm. that's good we're gonna go see the matrix again we are tonight mm-hmm. two of if us we have mentioned least. that one of you guys has got a launch society meeting believe me i wish i didn't have to do this <laughs> yeah. me too all right um so that that's it is that it is that all we're that, talking that, about that's all that's oh, all movies okay. and stuff we yeah, have yeah okay. um you now set up your next segment mm-hmm, for the hawkeye finale the show is finally over a bit bittersweet for some and heavily disliked by others. Nice. Let's talk about what happened in the Hawkeye season finale. Have you ever danced with the devil in the pale moonlight? Yeah, I can fly. I'm here to fight for truth and justice in the American way. People in this room, which one is A, wearing a spangly outfit, and B, not a fuse? There's only one God, man, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. Batman has no limits. Sammy and I decided to 
start binging Daredevil because yeah, of King so how's that going? And, this and you know Matt Murdock and No Way Home. I think we're what, four episodes, five, five, five episodes. Five. Okay, uh, so um, it's good. It's really good. Uh, we we started watching it but kind of back when it came out, but that was what seven years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, we were a little bit too young for that at the time, <laughs> so we stopped. Um, but we're back at it and. It's really good. It it's is really, really good. good show. I'm excited so. to watch more, and I'm I'm interested in seeing how the series ends. Actually, yeah. Awesome. Um, so, so this is Christmas. At least that's the title of the episode. So this is Christmas. I think that it was referring to that. Rating on one to ten kingpins. I guess let's just go with that. What did y'all think <laughs> of this episode? Oh man, mm, I'll give it an eight. Okay. Um, it was fun. There were some weird, weird things. I guess. Um. <laughs> But overall, yeah, it was it was a good episode, a good finale. Dad, I'm gonna go seven. I thought it was great, great series. Please don't get me wrong, don't get mad at me for saying a seven. But I think this episode itself felt clunky at a couple spots, like they weren't sure. And I still, I'm I'm gonna struggle, and I think you guys will once you watch more of, of Daredevil. Gonna struggle a little bit with how easily Kate Bishop took out Kingpin because it doesn't seem to make sense. But anyway, um, uh, other than that. It was a good episode. I'll, I'll talk. I'll talk about more about that about right. when okay. when we get to it. But what about you? You give it a rating? Oh, um, nine. I really enjoyed this finale. It was okay. a very good finale. Um, it, it didn't have any MCU like changing parts, and it really just told more of the story about Hawkeye, which is kind of what I've expected from these Disney Plus series. What we were told these Disney Plus MCU series were going to be about. Cool. You know, you don't have to watch them, but it helps. And so let's I have kind of three points here. We get, start with the Christmas party we see clint and kate arrive at the bishop security christmas party and they aren't alone they have backup in the form of larpers <laughs> as waiters as waiters after a bit Kazi decides to liven up the party and takes a shot at clint in the chaos kate finds her mom and confronts her about working with kingpin and um eventually during all the chaos clint kate and the larpers all evacuate the building but a new player just entered yelena as Clint tries to Kate find Bishop, <laughs> as Clint tries to find Kazi, Yelena and Kate are fighting ish, I guess, to get to Clint. Now, what did y'all think of this whole, I guess, opening sequence and uh, all Kate's and Kate and Yelena's chemistry? I guess. And they're, yeah, they're a lot of fun. They to watch are because mm-hmm. like they're they're like frenemies almost. Like they're sitting there like complimenting each other. I'm like, you know, you beat the crap out of me. Great job. You know, you had great Good form and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um it, it, even Kate was like, I stop making me like you. Like it, it, it was a lot of fun. Um so yeah, I mean I guess that was the main poll of, of I do think sequence. it's weird that the LARPers were just suddenly able to get hired <laughs> their actors as the caterers. Actors. The actors. <laughs> actors. <laughs> Trevor Slattery's part of the group <laughs> honestly i could see it. I could yeah, see absolutely it. i do i really did i, I okay i don't want to be me, i don't want to be negative explain and i'll explain to you why you're wrong i just felt like <laughs> yelena is like she's a black widow she doesn't want to kill anybody else and it feels like kate bishop is an equal to her no she it, doesn't want to hurt kate at all She's holding back. She's holding back as much as she can because that is not her mission. Kate, uh, Yelena is freeing past Black Widows from Mm -hmm. the control and she's a good guy, but she was hired to kill Clint and for reason of revenge on Natasha. And that was it. That's the only reason she's trying to kill Clint. And like, even when Kate hit Yelena in the elevator, she was shocked because of Yelena didn't want to hurt Kate. And so she was shocked that Kate went that distance, I guess. Um, now we see, then see Kate, Yelena, Jack, surprisingly enough, the tracksuit mafia, the LARPers, and Clint all on the rink in Rockefeller Center. Now Kate's mom is now gone, and we don't know where she went, but a giant fight breaks out between the tracksuit mafia and everyone else. We see some great teamwork between Kate and Clint in this sequence. Now what did y'all think about this fight, and the fact that Jack is actually a good guy, and a lot of fun too. I like Jack Duquesne as a character. Me too. I don't understand why he wore a sword to the party. <laughs> I mean, they said they, they said in the throwaway line that it was because he wanted to prove he was actually innocent. Um, I feel like that was just kind of like a, it, was a, it was weird. A, though. It was weird, but it was a lot of fun, and it, honestly, it fit his character in a way. 
Uh, he, yeah, he seems like kind of flashy really and flamboyant. And by God, for the whole series, you've got Clint and Kate walking through the streets of New York with a bow and arrow on their back, and nobody said anything. If us being in just got to suspend it's, reality, it's, there's a truth bit. to that. If, if, yeah. if us being in big city LA says anything, there are strange Actually, things. Actually, that's true. I could have seen, I could have, <laughs> I've been to New York. I mean, never mind. Guy walking down the street <laughs> with, with a sword. sword. No big deal. <laughs> it's weird. I've been to this. New York. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. LA and New York, you guys do that kind of stuff. And that's not, I'm mean, no, no, no judgment. I'm just saying, a little bit you know, I'm no, you know, I'm telling the truth, though. <laughs> you guys see stuff like that all the time and you're like, all right, whatever. So, so see, there's your explanation. I live in Daphne, Alabama. You don't see guys walking around with street. Now you see people you see with guys guns with everywhere. ARs on their back. Uh, yeah, that's different. So, <laughs> so yeah, um, you would think that was weird, mm-hmm. too. So yeah, uh, exactly. Um no, I thought the fight was was a lot of fun. They uh, all the trick arrows mm. were pretty cool um, to see, and like the well, the Home Alone feel mm-hmm. to it. Um, Jack was it was a fun character. A little weird that he was so w- suspicious in the beginning, but then turned out to be good. I, I didn't mind. I think they were playing on just right. People. They were totally playing on us, but that was fun. The LARPers getting into costume was yeah, a little Yeah, that was a little weird. strange. I think they were just trying to make themselves oh, be I like thought that was, superheroes. No, it but was I, hilarious. Because I, I, that's exactly what I thought was going on. They're like, oh, wait. We, they aren't listening Nobody's to listening to us. We have to look like we're from Asgard. Yeah. I think that's literally what they that, did. It's probably They was. threw okay, on the that LARPer costumes. Now. They look like they're from Asgard. There's Avengers running around <laughs> outside. So people are going to take that seriously. Okay, all right. That and makes more like, sense now. You know, I mean... I, I I thought that part made perfect sense to me. <laughs> but Jack with the sword, nah. <laughs> yeah. Now let's talk about the big emphasis on the big part of the uh-huh. Kingpin finds Kate's mom and just rips the door off of her car. This dude's buff. guy is a beast. Yeah, it's a good thing he separated the door completely. Exactly. <laughs> I've seen the episode four of Daredevil season one. I know what he can do Ooh. with the door. Uh, yeah, Kate proceeds to then shoot him in the chest with an arrow and he doesn't even flinch. He just breaks it. He just breaks it. This guy is a brick wall in some ways. Kate and Fisk fight and Kate just has absolutely no shot against Kingpin to win. She is getting thrown around the room. Every punch does barely anything to him and finally she outsmarts him and knocks him down long enough for her to get away and for her mom to get arrested and the way that she outsmarted him was her bunch of arrows her trick arrows were all laid out across the floor because he she, he took them and broke exactly them. and she took the too dangerous arrow from uh, that clint said was too dangerous and actually put it in her arsenal and then she used clint's trick of snapping something, she used his cufflink. She used his cufflink to spark it to give to let all those trick arrows, those explosive arrows, explode right underneath him, which would have killed any normal human, <laughs> but just knocked him down for a few minutes, which just shows how absolutely powerful Kingpin is. So it knocked him out just for a little bit for him to, for her to get away. So that that's kind of explaining to you. It wasn't a she overpowered him. It. It was just an explosion knocked him out that would have just absolutely okay. destroyed anybody else. Um, eventually, Maya catches up to Fisk and he tries to reason with her, and a shot rings off in the alley. Now, that was a direct quote is that the, from Marvel. Is that the captions? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it was it was in their recap review, and they didn't say anything. They just said a shot rings off in the alley. So, what did y'all think of Kingpin in this episode and the fight? And do you actually think he is dead? He better not be dead because that is a waste of a huge character. No pun intended. I mean, seriously, he is a big deal Mm -hmm. villain, not only for Daredevil, Daredevil, but for Spider-Man as well. Mm -hmm. You kill him. That is a huge mistake. I think he was fine. I again, we didn't quite have as much exposure to him as a lot of people did after watching Daredevil, but I think he was fine. He was tough granted yeah it, i can see how kate beating him would feel weird but it was a one in a million chance shot that happened it wasn't her outpower mm-hmm. you know outpowering exactly. she just got lucky with his standing and the, the cufflink um so i think it was a good representation of the mm-hmm. character but it would be a huge mistake if he's dead at this point uh what was the issue the oh, comic book, issue, Daredevil Year Two, or something like that. It was, it was issue volume 15, two, issue volume fifteen, two, issue, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, two fifteen has this this alley scene basically plays mm-hmm. out in a 
boxing boxing ring, ring um, right in that and we know kingpin doesn't get killed and it's the same He's story blinded in that story so in that, i don't know if he got blinded in this but they ain't gonna kill him off not with yeah, echoes with the series coming with echo with daredevil being reintroduced into the mcu and no way home dry the cox uh, uh matt murdoch all that um with it it's gonna be uh I think it's going to be just fine Mm -hmm. with it. I think that people need to chill out. I think that this, this series um, suffers from the other series seeming to have bigger implications Mm -hmm. than this. I think you've got WandaVision and Loki and not so much Falcon and Winter Soldier, but WandaVision and Loki specifically made, made those series feel like the weight of those series was bigger. And this one, it ended. Mm hmm. In yeah. a lot of ways. And it, it, it was something... It's what I liked about it. Because before all the Disney Plus MCU shows came out, Kevin Feige, I think they got that right, um, said that you don't need to watch the Disney Plus shows to understand what's going on in the MCU. Now we know that is not true for WandaVision because of Doctor Strange 2. You're going to be confused as to what happened with what her. If? What if? What Red SU is. What if? Um, with Falcon and Winter Soldier, you're going to wonder how the heck Falcon became Captain America. With Loki, you're going to wonder how the multiverse is broken and, and where, where King he is and where King came from. And with this one, okay, it, it, you don't really need to watch I mean, the series. You're going to wonder where Kate is from and why she's Hawkeye. But it doesn't feel as big as the other ones. And it feels like what we were expecting with these MCU shows by from from what it originally was happening. So it kind of feels true to what happens now. What are y'all... Y'all's thoughts on the overall series so far, because they're still calling it a season finale, not a series. Mm. So, no, I think it was it was good. It I liked the smaller down to earth feel. Um, it definitely is different than what we'd gotten before, but there's nothing wrong with that. It's good to have some grounded stories every so often, mm. and I appreciated that in this show. Um, it did suffer occasionally just from some weird choices and weird moments like the end credit scene was a little disappointing like it would have been fine if it just wasn't there at all almost um but i mean it's just silly little things like that that i have gripes for otherwise it was funny it was heartfelt it had it had fun action it was very human yeah it was a very human show and i appreciated it so overall i i enjoyed it i'm glad that that Clint got home. Yes. Yeah. For, for real. With Kate, which was awesome with Kate. I think that this is setting up a future for Kate. Mm-hmm. And, um, well, I mean, he calls her his partner. Uh, mm-hmm. Clint does. I think that's going to turn into something in the future. It'd be kind of cool. If, you know, we, everybody has kind of joked around that this is like Die Hard in the, multi, in the MCU because you've got a, a movie, you know, it's an mm-hmm. action movie mm-hmm. set around Chris or action story about uh, set around Christmas. And, and if you've guys, you guys aren't familiar with Die Hard, you guys haven't ever even watched it, but Die Hard 2 is around Christmas, Die Hard 3 is around Christmas, Die Hard 4 is around, I mean, all of them are take okay. place around the Christmas. So I think it would be kind of cool if they could figure out a way to yeah. keep telling these stories around Christmas that time. That would be fun. And it would just be something that you look forward to mm-hmm. in that spirit, that period between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Christmas and and you 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 know you have some fun with it have a little bit of a tradition yeah yeah well we finally got something for Hawkeye and it was even better than I could have expected the future for Clint and Kate as Hawkeye looks uncertain but I'm excited to see where it goes awesome good job Mimi Nate thank you did you really I mean you love this series oh I did I really was it your favorite oh out of the MCU shows definitely that's cool definitely interesting that's awesome all right anything else you guys want to talk about anything else Keanu Reeves has apparently met with Marvel about joining the MCU. Wow, our whole episode just like comes together in this. Mm. Wow. That's I'd be awesome. down for that. That'd yeah, be me fun. too. And uh, Michael Keaton is apparently going to reprise his role as Batman in Batgirl. How are you feeling about that? Pretty good. Um, depending on how the whole Flash stuff works with him being, it's probably going to have him being brought into multiple universes. And there was a rumor a few months ago that he was going to be the Nick Fury of the DCEU, well, this version cool. of Batman. I, oh, I like that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Star Wars employee Christmas gift uh, that they all got. Someone mm-hmm. took a picture of it. It has, it hints, which by the way, it's like a portable record player. Anyway, um, cool. it hints at a new Tales of the Jedi project, which is a Dark Horse comic series. You know, Star uh-huh. Wars and Dark, and Dark mm-hmm. Horse have come back together again. There was a logo on there for this new Tales mm-hmm. of the Jedi. So that could be a 
very exciting. Um, that's going to pretty much do it. Uh, Friday's uh, episode, again, our interview series is going to be with Jeffrey, Jeffrey Calhoun. Yeah, I got it right. Uh, Jeffrey Calhoun is going to talk about what makes a good story. And we're going to look at some of the MCU stuff and Star Wars stuff and talk a little bit about those and why sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I think it's going to be a lot of fun with that. Thank you, Cufflinks.com, for sponsoring the show. You guys, um, honestly, you know, there's two things I noticed. One, uh, this week that makes me think of Cufflinks.com. One, Kingpin lost a cufflink. He needs a new one. So somebody mm-hmm. should send some cufflinks to Do they have his Vincent cufflinks Dimofrey. on the Are website? Gonna, because they need to they, have they his need cufflinks. To make that Are you going to talk about the Batman? The Batman? The cufflinks? No, was there? Oh, there was. Oh, that's there was three. The there was. Ba- oh man! Oh I'll yeah, I would get those. <laughs> Come on, guys. dang! And then um, last night, I think it was last night during the football game, the color commentator was talking about his collection of R two D two cufflinks. Oh, that is awesome! Does he have any from cufflinks? Tiki Barber um, is a big R two D two cufflinks awesome. guy, so maybe we should see if we can work with cufflinks to get yeah. him some cufflinks. Um, there we go. That. Thank you guys so much for listening to Tatooine Sons, a pop culture podcast. If you had a good time listening, if, it would be awesome if you could share this with your friends. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're right there. Yeah. Um, and of course, the show is only a small part of the Tatooine Sons world. So be sure to like us on Facebook and join our Tatooine Sons discussion group and follow us on Twitter to get in on all the action and keep up to date on everything we got going on at TatooineSons.com. Absolutely. Don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss uh, any episode. And remember to drop us a review. Again, Spotify has opened up reviews. So even if you've given us a review before, go to Spotify, please, and help us get some reviews on that platform. And when you do that, we'll make a donation in your honor to onechild.com to help um, a child living in extreme poverty. That's pretty much going to do it. Anything else you guys like to say? May the force be with you. May the force be with you. May the force be with you always. This party's over. I like that monkey. Don't get technical with me. Joy, please. Yep, yep.